Welcome to Unexplained Unsolved Crimes. So I started down this tangled little web, the Oakland County Child Killer, also known as the Babysitter Killer. And it was dubbed the Babysitter Killer because the children showed evidence of having been cleaned and fed their favorite foods. This case started back in 1976 and went into 1977. And during the 13-month period of February 15th, 1976, through March 16th of 1977, four children were abducted and murdered with their bodies left in various locations within the Oakland County region in Michigan. The children were held anywhere from four to 19 days before they were killed. And their deaths triggered the largest murder investigation in U.S. history at that time. The first child to disappear was 12-year-old Mark Stebbins on Sunday, February 15, 1976. Mark left the American Legion Hall in Ferndale after telling his mother he was going home to watch television. They found his fully clothed body four days later in a snowbank in the parking lot of an office building and 10 Mile Road and Greenfield in Southfield. Mark's wrists and ankles showed evidence of rope marks and he had been strangled and sexually assaulted and had two lacerations on the left rear of his head. The second child, Joe Robinson, who was 12, disappeared 10 months later on Wednesday, December 22nd, 1976, after having an argument with her mother it's been alleged that Jill packed a backpack and ran away from home on her bike. The day after she disappeared, her bike was found behind a hobby store on Main Street. Jill's body was found on the morning of December 26, 1976, along Interstate 75 near Big Beaver Road in Troy. Jill was killed by a single 12-gauge shotgun blast to the face while lying face up in the very position she was found. She was fully clothed and still wearing her backpack. Jill's body was placed within sight of the Troy police station, laid neatly in the snow. The third child to disappear was 10-year-old Christine Mihalich on Sunday, January 2nd, 1977. Christine was last seen buying a magazine at a 7-Eleven in Berkeley at three o'clock in the afternoon. Christine was reported missing by her mother three hours later. Christine's body was found fully clothed 19 days later in the snow by a mail carrier in Franklin Village. Christine had been smothered. Her body was laid within view of nearby homes with her eyes closed and her arms folded across her chest. An autopsy revealed that she died less than 24 hours before her body was found. And the fourth known murder was 11-year-old Timothy King on Wednesday, March 16, 1977. Timothy had borrowed 30 cents from his sister and jumped on a skateboard to go buy some candy at the Hunter Maple Pharmacy, which is in a shopping center near his house in Birmingham. He left the store through the rear entrance and into a parking lot at around 8.30 that night. Tim's parents went to the media for help where his father, Barry, begged the abductor to release his son unharmed and his mother, Marion, wrote a letter that was printed in the Detroit News promising him Kentucky Fried Chicken when he returned home, which was his favorite meal. In the late evening hours of March 22, 1977, two teenagers spotted Timothy's body in a shallow ditch from their car in Livonia. Tim had marks on his wrists and ankles suggesting he had been bound and was also sexually abused and suffocated. Tim's skateboard was placed next to his body. When the coroner did the autopsy, he noted that Tim had been murdered approximately six hours before his body was found and that he had eaten Kentucky Fried Chicken before his death. All of the children showed evidence of having been cleaned. Tim's clothes had also been washed and pressed. There were other abductions and murders around the Oakland County area within the same period, but these 
aren't specifically tied to the four victims above due to variations in the cases. One of those was a 16-year-old named Cynthia Cadix, who was abducted and bludgeoned to death in the evening of January 15, 1976 from Roseville. She was discovered nude and battered in Bloomfield Township in the early morning hours of January 16, 1976. There is also a 14-year-old named Jane Allen, who was murdered after she accepted a ride while hitchhiking in Royal Oak on August 7, 1976. Jane's body was found floating in a river in, in Miamisburg, Ohio on August 11, 1976. She was murdered by carbon monoxide poisoning. Another possible murder that was connected but not proven is 12-year-old Kimberly Alice King, who was last seen in Warren, Michigan on September 15, 1979. Kim is believed to have been abducted and authorities have considered that her disappearance could be connected to the unsolved killings. Kimberly's body has never been found. It wasn't until after the discovery of the third victim, Christine Mihalich, that Authorities realized they were dealing with three related cases with evidence that was similar. Reports were then released publicly of the possibility of a serial killer in the Oakland County area. The Michigan State Police led a group of law enforcement officials from 13 communities into the formation of a task force devoted solely to the investigation. Soon after Timothy King was abducted, a woman claimed she had seen a boy with a skateboard talking to a man in a parking lot of the drugstore that Timothy said he was going to. A composite drawing of the suspected kidnapper along with his vehicle, which was a blue AMC Gremlin with a white side stripe, was released. The man was described as a white male with a dark complexion between 25 and 35 with shaggy hair and sideburns. It's believed that the killer had a job that gave him freedom of movement and may have appeared to be someone that a child might trust, such as a doctor, clergyman, police officer, but that he was familiar with the area and had the ability to keep children for long periods of time without any neighbors noticing. The task force checked out more than 18,000 tips that resulted in two dozen arrests for unrelated charges and also busted up a multi-state child pornography ring operated on North Fox Island in Lake Michigan. There are five persons of interest. The first person is Allen. A few weeks after the death of Timothy King, Dr. Bruce Danto, a Detroit psychiatrist working with the task force, received a poorly spelled, guilt-ridden letter by someone identifying themselves as Allen who claimed he was a sadomasochist a slave of his roommate, Frank, who is the Oakland County child killer. Allen wrote a pleading, fearful, and remorseful letter indicating that he was losing his sanity, endangered, and suicidal. Allen wrote that he accompanied Frank on many road trips seeking boys, but he never was present during the abductions for the boys that Frank murdered. Allen confirmed that Frank drove a gremlin but that Frank junked the gremlin out in Ohio, never to be seen again. Allen stated that Frank was traumatized by killing children in the Vietnam War and that he was taking revenge on more affluent citizens, such as the residents of Birmingham. Allen wrote that Frank wanted rich people to suffer for sending forces to Vietnam and received nothing in return. Allen instructed Dr. Dano to respond by printing the code words, quote, Weather Bureau says trees to bloom in three weeks, unquote, and that Sunday's free press edition. Soon after, Dr. Dano received a phone call from Allen, who offered to provide photographic evidence in exchange for a letter from Michigan Governor William Milliken guaranteeing immunity from prosecution. Dr. Dano was to meet Allen at a bar called the Pony Cart Bar near Detroit's Palmer Woods neighborhood, but Allen didn't show up and was never heard from again. Another person of interest was Archibald Edward Sloan. Now Sloan was a pedophile who victimized young boys in his neighborhood. He became a person of interest when hair samples found in his 1966 Pontiac Bonneville matched hair samples found on the bodies of Timothy King and Mark Sevens. Sadly, however, the hair samples 
did not match Sloan. However, Sloan apparently loaned his car out to many of his pedophile friends. Next is John Wayne Gacy. Now, John Wayne Gacy is a serial killer from Cook County, Illinois, who was allegedly in Michigan at the time of the murders, but he was proven to not be involved through DNA testing. Then there was Theodore Lamborghini, or Ted. Ted was a retired auto worker believed to be involved in a child porn ring in the 70s. On March 27, 2007, investigators told Detroit television station WXYZ that Ted was considered the top suspect in the case. Mr. Lamborghini pled guilty to 15 sex-related counts involving young boys rather than accept a plea bargain that would have required him to take a polygraph test on the Oakland County child killings. He also rejected an offer of a reduced sentence in exchange for a polygraph on the case. In October of 2007, the family of Mark Stebbins filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Mr. Lamborghini seeking $25,000. The lawsuit alleged that Ted, who lived in Metro Detroit in the late 70s, abducted Mark and held him captive in a Royal Oak house for four days in February of 1976 before smothering him to death during a sexual assault. However, Ted was never formally linked or charged in the death of Mark Stebbins. Then there was Chris Bush. Chris was the son of Harold Bush, a high-level General Motors executive. Chris had been in police custody shortly before Timothy's abduction for suspected involvement in child pornography. He allegedly committed suicide in November 1978. However, there was no gunshot residue found and no blood spatter on him. There were also four shell casings found in his room and he was found wrapped neatly under his sheets with one bullet hole between his eyes. And apparently a long gun was found near there was a blood-stained rope found in his apartment, as was a hand-drawn image of a boy closely resembling Mark Stebbins screaming in agony, which was found pinned to the wall. In December of 1978, the task force disbanded due to lack of evidence and progression, and the investigation was turned over to the state police. Now, DNA testing didn't start until 1985. So there wasn't any at that time, but they did collect evidence. There's DNA found on some of the bodies from the main perpetrator, but that DNA does not match anyone named in connection with the case, and their identity is not known at this time. But there are suspicions. And according to Wikipedia, forensic DNA testing has indirectly implicated two suspects since then. One suspect is now dead, and the other is serving a life sentence in prison for offenses against children. On March 22, 2006, Scott Lewis on Fox 2 broke a story about the Oakland County child killer that was very compelling. It stated, 30 years ago, the entire metro area was abuzz about four young children who were abducted and later found murdered. What was very strange is that the children were kept alive for a period of up to several weeks, before they were murdered. Richard Lawson, who was sentenced on March 22, 2006, for the killing of a Livonia cab company owner, made some startling revelations. He said, Bobby Moore, a man who ran a bike shop on Cass Ave in the 70s, was involved in a pedophile ring and is the killer. He also went on to say that a man named Ted, who now lives in Ohio, is also involved. He said Bobby Moore had a blue gremlin, but put it in a truck and dismantled it when word was out that police were looking for it. He disposed of the parts and dumpsters in the Cass Corridor, including the dumpster at Cass Tech. Bobby Moore is also said to have died about 15 years prior. Lewis said the police had given a lie detector test to Ted, but that he failed. Lawson passed his test. The police reports obtained by Ken King included new revelations, including DNA testing of new suspects. The family of Timothy King filled out a Freedom of Information Act for the records to the investigation of this case. Police reports were obtained by Ken King, Timothy's dad, and it included new revelations including DNA testing of new suspects, a sketch found at the scene of Bush's suicide resembling Mark Stebbins, 
and a bloody rope found at the scene of Bush's suicide. The King family then produced a documentary entitled Decade of Deceit, which condemns the investigators and prosecutors for allegedly shoddy investigations and uncooperative communication and for disregarding leads that the King family discovered in 2006. Funds from the sale of the documentary were donated to the Tim King Fund, which is designated to help abuse children and support child activities for Birmingham children. According to the True Crime Diary on June 14th of 2011, the Oakland County child killings may have remained a vague, bad memory, but for a chance conversation between two men in Las Vegas in July of 2006. Patrick Coffey, a polygraph examiner from California, was giving a speech at a polygraph conference. After his presentation, he began talking with Lawrence Wasser, a forensic polygraph examiner from Michigan. Coffey mentioned that He'd grown up in Birmingham, Michigan, and that part of the reason he'd gotten into polygraph examination was because his neighbor and friend, Tim King, had been murdered by the Oakland County child killer. What happened next is in dispute, but Coffey maintains that Wasser confided something extraordinary, and that 30 years ago, he conducted an attorney-client privilege polygraph on the killer who had confessed. Wasser said the suspect and attorney neither of whom he identified by name, were both now dead. Coffey was stunned. The case had languished in a black hole for years. After nearly three decades, the victim's families had little hope it would ever be solved. But Wasser, apparently regretting his spontaneous outburst and possibly concerned about the attorney-client privilege issue, ignored Coffey's further inquiries on the subject. Nevertheless, Coffey got in touch with members of the King family, who then reached out to investigators they trusted. The family eventually got a phone call, and with it came, at long last, the polygraph suspect's name. That chance encounter between two polygraph examiners would have a reverberating effect on the case. The result was a renewed interest in three long-ago events, seemingly unrelated at the time. Some of these pieces were never thought to be part of the puzzle, but when arrayed in sequence, the parts fit, and in a complex and vexing case, began to make sense. Now, interestingly, forensic DNA tests done in 2012 showed the hair found on the seat of the convicted child molester Archibald Sloan's 1966 Pontiac Bonneville, and on the bodies of the victims of Mark Stebbins and Timothy King, were a match and came from the same unknown man. However, this hair does not match Sloan, but it does implicate someone he knew or lent his car to. Apparently he's not talking. I'm gonna stop this right here and I'll have to do a part two. There are so many twists and turns and ups and downs and all arounds in this case. It's, right now I have more questions than I have answers. I. I, it seems like there was some cover-up being done. Things just aren't matching up. I mean, honestly, in the beginning, it seems like it's kind of cut and dry because the killing stopped after Chris Bush's death, which I don't think that was a suicide. But I also saw notes where there was somebody that Chris Bush molested as a child who was kind of enslaved to him. So I'm wondering if in the beginning, Chris Bush had something to do with the boys' deaths and, well, the girls. I, I don't understand the one with the shotgun, except that she had the same hairs on her, which I do believe are dog hairs. And that's a whole other tangent. And it just seems like, you know, there's a possibility Chris Bush did do the murders of these boys and the other person who was enslaved to him was perhaps the one that took care of and fed the children and perhaps murdered him. I mean, it seems feasible. Just, you want to spend hours hunting something down, just run through Google images of the Oakland County child killer. And there are documents upon documents upon documents in there from the investigation. But make sure you have a free day or two, perhaps a week, 
there's a lot of information out there and the twists, the turns, the, the, the tangents, they're all kind of confusing. And was the investigation thrown off in the first place because they were looking for the wrong car? Was there more than one murderer? So many questions. So I have a lot of questions. Please leave me your thoughts in the comments. I would love to hear them. And I will definitely be doing another part to this, perhaps from a different angle, see if maybe can piece it together. I mean, I don't know. The police haven't been able to. Or maybe they have, but the murderer is dead. It is possible that the actual murderer is dead at this time and, you know, therefore you're never going to get the final answer. But nowadays with DNA, you get a much quicker answer, I would hope. But hey, you know, who knows? So again, leave your thoughts. Thank you for listening. And I will let you know when part two is out.